It is, because it cuts to the heart of the gospel. Mm -hmm. This really isn't fundamentally an eschatological issue. It's a, Christ, it's a Christological issue. And this was recognized very far back in the history of the church. If you take a look at the Athanasian <clears throat> Creed, it's a Christological creed, but if you read it, there are so many eschatological statements in it, and you have to wonder why. And the reason is Christ came to do something specific. And if you deny that he is not, you know, if you deny that he's going to raise us physically and bodily the way he was raised, that he's going to undo the curse that Adam brought upon the world, that sin is going to be outside, uh, you know, we won't have to tolerate sin and death forever, you are denying Christ's redemptive work. It cuts to the very heart of the gospel. They have a completely different hope. Um, Paul said, if there's no resurrection of the dead, we of most men are most pitiful. Eat, you know, eat, drink today, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Mm -hmm. They do not have the same hope that we did. There are hyperpreterists, and I think these are the more honest ones, who explicitly say that hyperpreterism is an essential part of the gospel. Wow. Wow. Well, it seems to be that... Uh... The ministries that uh, have adopted, or the people that have adopted hyperpreterism, this has almost, it seems, become their gospel. This, this is their message. Uh, it eclipses everything else, it seems to me. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, I do, and I, and I believe that is evidence, uh, uh, yet yeah, another evidence that speaks to how they, even in their actions, admit that this is gospel for them. And if you step back and try to look at it through the eyes of a hyperpreterist, it makes sense. If you believe that the consummation has already happened and there are people who are running around not realizing it, you will think that those people are not living the abundant life, that everything that God has for them, that, that they're denigrating the consummation. So obviously they are going to pursue it with zeal because it is such an essential part of the gospel it's the same way we would pursue with zeal the trinity uh -huh. so we're talking about just foundational beliefs i can't remember what book of the bible it's in forgive me for that sometimes my memory has a slip but there is a passage that talks about you know the believers who were still on milk rather than eating meat. Mm -hmm. One of the milk doctrines is the resurrection of the dead. Mm. It's like something a baby Christian needs to understand and know before they move on to anything else. Yeah, we have that in the scripture mentioned, the heresy of Hymenaeus and Philetus. Uh, do we have anything, an ancient source, rejecting the future return of Christ? Um, uh, especially, obviously, non-believers would always reject that. But I'm speaking of, uh, obviously, people who profess to be a part of the body of Christ who taught that Christ's return had already uh, taken place. We actually do. And, unfortunately, I do not have that reference at my fingertips because I'm okay. in this interior room of my office building, okay. and I do not get Internet connectivity. But I have several quotes from ancient church fathers. These will all be on your websites and so forth. Yes, it yeah. will be at, at Preterist site, and it will be on the page that is called Contra Hymenaean Resources. <clears throat> Up at the very top, I believe it is. And I think Polycarp may be the person I'm thinking of, but I do not want to say something falsely. There are multiple quotes, but there's a great quote on the Contra Hymenaean page that I think everyone needs to take to heart. And it's a quote from a hyperpreterist. It's a hyperpreterist who's a friend of mine by the name of David Green. He had a debate with Keith Matheson, uh -huh. and David forthrightly admitted that for anyone who believes that the resurrection is future then they absolutely have to view as damnable heresy anything that teaches the resurrection is past huh. david green is ruthlessly logical yeah <clears throat> well, i would agree with him <laughs> yeah, i mean i agree with him and i respect him <clears throat> yes. for coming out and saying that yeah i obviously don't agree with his beliefs but i agree with his, his logical conclusion that he yeah david's uh, been my friend for for years because uh -huh. i believe he is honest 
Yes, and uh, going back to one of the hallmarks you said of the uh, hyper preterist camp, <clears throat> that uh, Jesus' uh, final coming was at the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. Cannot an Orthodox, Bible-believing, evangelical preterist believe that was a coming, but not his final future uh, bodily visible coming? Absolutely. Okay. That is, in fact, what all Orthodox preterists believe. Yes, just There's wanna... a coming mentioned in Matthew 24, but there are comings mentioned all over the Scripture that mm -hmm. all Christians recognize aren't the second coming. When right. Christ says, I, I will not leave you orphans, I yes. will come to you. He's, yeah. You know, the threats to the churches in the seven letters to um, in the beginning of Revelation, to one of them, he says, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and take away your lampstand. Now, Jesus certainly wasn't threatening to come and set the world on fire if this one church didn't repent. Mm -hmm. By the way, well, I want to uh, connect for our listeners who didn't recognize the name Keith Matheson, who Dee Dee Warren was speaking of before. Keith Matheson uh, wrote a book against hyperpreterism. He edited it, and there were many contributors to it. Uh, and um, I can't remember the exact title right now, but uh, Keith, Matheson, Keith Matheson is on staff with Ligonier Ministries, the ministry of R.C. Sproul, and uh, Burke Parsons, uh, who is also uh, involved in that ministry, is our guest tomorrow. But we uh, hope to have Keith uh, eventually as a guest as well on Iron Sharp Design to discuss something. Um, I think that the title of the book may be When Shall These Things Be? Or uh, yes, it is, yeah, okay. with the subtitle, A Reformed Response to Hyperpreterism. Right, okay, great. And yeah. uh, one thing I, jot, I jotted down here so I didn't forget, I know many people would consider me an expert on this topic. I do not claim that title for myself. I'm a lay person mm -hmm. who just has devoted a lot of time to studying it. Yeah. And I am removing the possibility for the inevitable hyperpreterist mockery that would happen after the show if I did not... You know, yes. You know, put, put that up up front. Yes, th those were my were words. Apart the show for anything right. to make fun of. Yeah, <laughs> those were my words, ladies and gentlemen. They were my words because of what I've heard from people who know Didi and who know the subject. And uh, there are very few. I, I know for a fact that there are very few people who can articulately uh, discuss this topic, other than somebody who just wants to proselytize it. And uh, I, as I said, I would love to hear from a. a person who believes that um, the teachings of eschatology that Didi is condemning are true and biblical. Uh, I know you, you would not call yourselves hyper-preterists. Uh, you would call yourselves preterists, or you would believe in realized eschatology. And what are some of the other uh, labels that they have uh, used to identify themselves with Didi? It would be just preterist, which is historically absolutely incorrect. Right. Um, they would call themselves full preterists. Right. And I object to that for other reasons, which if you're interested in, I can let you know. And realized eschatology would be another one. And like, uh, uh, Max King coined covenant eschatology as well. Right, I was going to say new covenant eschatology. There really isn't much more. I think that that pretty much runs the gamut right there. Well, if you would like to join us on the air, if you believe in those, or believe in that uh, eschatological view, you may join us on the air with a, uh, a brief, very brief comment or question for Dee Dee at 631-321-WNYG, 631-321-WNYG. And, of course, if you agree with Dee Dee, we would love to hear from you. Or if you've just never heard of this controversy before, we would love to hear from you at 631-321-WNYG, 631-321-WNYG. Now, Dee Dee, how did you uh, become very briefly... Uh, a hyperpreterist, and what were you before that, and what are you now? <laughs> okay, as I said, as a as a young Christian, I simply believed pretty much anything that the pastor said. <laughs> I, you know, I, I hadn't read the whole Bible yet. Uh -huh. You know, I was brand new. I did go through that. You know, you read the Bible in a year thing that's on the back of the ones you know they hand at the altar calls, and I started running across passages that greatly troubled me, and the one that kept coming up was Matthew twenty four thirty four, and it it really rocked my faith so I had taken to the habit of 
pretty much cornering any pastor I could find to get them to explain that passage to me. I called Hank Hanegraaff and you know, anytime I went to a Christian bookstore, I'd, you know, zoom on over to the commentary section and just devour anything I could find on Matthew 24, 34. And I did not believe any of them answered the questions that I had. So right about that time, the Internet was becoming more of a popular medium, you know, rather than just the arena of geeks and, you know, news, newsless servers. So I did some searching online, and at that time, hyperpreterism was a massive online, uh, I don't want to say experiment, community, you know, project. And that's what I ran into, hyperpreterist materials. And I was completely unequipped to deal with it. I had never been forewarned about it. I was pretty much shocked that there was anything other than dispensational futurism. Um, 